Oh, okay. Still a little buggy. So did you get a chance to watch the lecture? Um, any questions or comments? You can talk. Why are you so shy? Yeah, I got a chance to watch it, but uh, I was looking at the screen. Uh, is the words up there now? What's that? Are the words up there now on the screen? Because it's hard to see. It's real blurry. No, not yet. OK. All right. So can you see this? Oh, yeah. OK, good. Thank you. All right, so um, just very quickly. So the most important stuff from first lecture was um, this relationship. which is equation 1.1.4 in Weinberg. This is the book. So it's a relationship between the pressure, which can be produced by any force, and the gravitational force. So it doesn't matter you know, if you have um, a gas or a plasma or uh, mud, you know, if it's, um, if it's a sphere and it's uh, big enough, the gravitational attraction is large enough, then you're going to uh, have this kind of um, equilibrium. And the other one, that was important. So eventually we got to this one. Right, so this is the pressure at the center of that sphere has to be greater than or equal to that expression. So the gravitational constant, mass squared, 8 pi times uh, or uh, radius to the fourth. And uh, then I had a few uh, examples, the sun, the earth, and a neutron star. And you can see that this uh, inequality holds. And I was watching some uh, Weinberg videos um, yesterday, and he said that uh, you know, he was asked what, uh, what beauty was in a, in a physical theory. And what he said is uh, that you, he, he, what he considered beautiful was a theory that didn't have any empirical parameters. And you can see that he will say that this is beautiful. It's completely from first principles. And you'll see that you know, the, the rest of his um, exposition, um, it's very much like that. OK, so. This guy over here, 1.1.4, is the fundamental equation of hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, no parameters, so mass, you know, it's pretty, it's as fundamental as you can get, and volume is also pretty fundamental, or uh, sorry, uh, space, so the, the radius. Uh, what you can see is that what matters is the pressure gradient, not necessarily um, just the pressure. So now we're going to use this relationship, 1.1.4, to get the potential energy as a functional of the pressure. So omega is going to be the, the, the gravitational potential energy. So if you start 
and this is a similar idea. Last time you have your sphere and you start removing uh, a very thin layer, okay? So the, the thickness of this layer is dr, and it is a distance r from the center of your sphere. So then what is gonna be the energy required to remove all the mass layer by layer, peel it off like a giant onion? If the gravitational potential is omega, then what is the energy required? Hmm? Negative. Negative omega. All right, so at this distance r, the shell is going to feel a force due to the rest of the mass that uh, it's still in the uh, in the sphere. So, but at, if, if you move it to infinity, then the force is zero, and so the energy um, is also zero. There's no there's no potential energy anymore. So, the gravitational force is going to be G M of R divided by R prime squared. So this is um, the sphere with a mass up to radius R. And you multiply times the mass of the shell, which is going to be 4 pi R squared, so the whole area times the density at that particular radius times dr, which is a, a very small thickness of this uh, shell. So then uh, the energy required to remove that layer is going to be um, that. So this one. And there are uh, really two radiuses or two radii here, uh, R prime and uh, regular R. So we're going to integrate it out uh, first the R prime and then the, uh, the other one. So the R prime is going to give you just the, uh, the energy of the shell, of one shell. So uh, this guy over here, There you go. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Um, it's going to be just one over R positive. So at infinity, as I mentioned, the energy is just zero. So then I'm going to write it like this. The potential energy of one layer is G MR 4 pi R rho, which is a function of R dr. So if we want to get the potential energy of the whole thing, what do we do now? Integrate from what kind of R? Yeah, 
so the from the center of the sphere to where your body ends. Right, so. Um, I'm going to put it over here. So this was the, the potential energy, but once you start removing it, yes. Um, yes. Mm. Well, I guess I don't have to write again. I'll just leave it as negative here and get rid of the layers. All right, so so then from the hydrostatic equilibrium, we get that this part over here, so the G the M and the rho is this guy over here, right? So then we can write the negative omega as minus 4 pi integral from 0 to r, r squared dp, which is a function of r, dr, r dr. So we have the two negatives here. And just move in positive. And these DRs we can cancel them out. And so we have, uh, wait, can I oh, forget about this um, R over here? So it's there. Then this is 4 pi integral from 0 to r, r cubed, um, that's it. So now what we're going to do is We're going to integrate by parts. So U is going to be the R cube, DV is DP. So then V is P. Again, this is a uh, function of R and du uh, is just three R um, squared dr. So integral of u dv is u times v minus the integral um, of V du. So in this case, we have the integral from zero to R. So um, omega 
I'm going to move these four pi over here so that I don't have to think about it. So let's see R cube. Uh, P, which I'm not forget, is a function of R. And this is evaluated from zero to R, capital R. So this first term, do we know what is at capital R? Why? So it's the end of the body, right? So P of R is zero. So it means that the whole thing is zero. What about at zero? R is zero, so that's also zero. Okay, so we, we can forget about oh. so we can forget about the first term. So we just get that omega is minus three integral from zero to R PR. Um, so four pi, we move it over here. R squared dr. So that's the gravitational potential energy in terms of pressure that can be caused by anything, but if it is in um, hydrostatic equilibrium. So it's kind of cool. Um, so let's switch gears. Um, for a little bit, and then we're going to connect it. At the end. Well, no wonder I was no artist. Anyways, that's supposed to be um, <laughs> yes, it's a it's a square planet. Uh, so this is an area you can think about it a little bit as a solid angle. So it's a it's a it's a very small element um, at some radius, and you have your thickness dr. So this is. Uh, the same as um, that I mentioned uh, in the lecture last time. But now we have um, a bunch of particles in there. And the particles um, are going to be, they have some, some kinetic energy. So They have some finite temperature, so non-zero temperature. And remember that uh, your kinetic energy is just going to be, I want to use a different letter here. So just remember that average kinetic energy of the particles is 
uh, proportional to the temperature uh, in thermodynamic equilibrium. So this is, you know, it can be anywhere inside the sphere. So let's say that it's there, you know, it's uh, some radius r inside of the sphere. We're going to say that it has a energy density E. The thermal energy density. So what do you expect of that function? Do you expect the energy density to be uniform throughout the sphere? Or do you expect to change? It's going to be changing. So is it going to be a monotonic change or no? Maybe. It will depend on the the particular situation of your um, of your body, like if it's you know a, a blue giant or a red giant. Uh, but you know the general behavior is that the energy is going to be greater at the center. And it's going to uh, decrease. You know, again, the, it, it might not be monotonic, but maybe it's going to look a little bit like that. Is it going to have energy at the very end, at the surface? Yeah, right. So the pressure was exactly zero at the end. That That's the condition for for the uh, the body to reach its end, um, the thermal energy is not going to be quite like that. It's going to have some finite um, energy, but it is a function uh, of the radius. You know, even if you if you say that uh, you know for simplicity that it's constant, so then. The kinetic energy, and Weinberg uses um, epsilon. You know, the definition is is that. So it is very similar to what we had for gravity, but. This one is the thermal energy. So let's say the kinetic energy of the of the particles at the I guess at the macroscopic level. So then the total energy is um, omega plus epsilon. So we had the four pi everywhere in both the uh, the equation uh, for gravity and in this one. Uh, both were from the center of the sphere to the end. Um, you have have these r squared dr in both of them. So this is going to be E, which is a function of the radius, and omega was minus 3 PR.
So if the object is stable, so if the matter in the object is gravitationally bound, then the total energy should be negative, right? What is the implication for uh, the relationship between uh, the pressure and the energy density? Well, the energy density should be less than three times the pressure. And if you want the whole thing to be negative. So, Let's remember that the pressure is force over area. So force is pressure times area. If we're going to do work against, let's say, an ideal gas or some sort of fluid, um, we need, there's going to be force Let's call it R times the, uh, the displacement, dr. And this is a volume, this is just PV. And in general, the pressure is the change in internal energy divided by the change in the volume. All right, so then we can see that there is a relationship between the pressure and, and the energy density. One is proportional to the other. So we will see why we are choosing this form in a little bit, but let the energy density be the pressure divided by omega minus one. So then um, one over omega minus one is a proportionality constant. Between the pressure and the energy density. So the particular value of gamma is going to depend on what is creating the, the pressure. So the particular force or the phenomenon and also the medium. So if you have a plasma or if you have um, the ideal gas or radiation. So for the ideal gas, What is this? Pressure times volume. Hmm? Mm -hmm. In the case of the ideal gas, what is the expression? Yep, N 
inner team. And what is the um, the energy, total energy of the ideal gas at temperature T? Three halves. What else? Huh? Yep, yeah, PBT. Um, or um, you can also use uh, the gas constant R. Okay, so we can see that um, the pressure is. NRT divided by the volume. I have to be a little bit more careful with my P's. They're starting to look like rows. Um, So this is three halves of um, okay. So the energy density is U divided by the volume. So we can put a volume over here. Um, so P is these and E, energy density, is U uh, over V. So the pressure is two thirds of the energy density. So uh, the proportionality constant is uh, one divided by gamma minus one. So for the case of the ideal gas, So this is three halves in, instead of two thirds because of how I wrote it over here. This is the relationship between uh, E and P, and this is P and E. So it's the other way around. So this implies that two is three gamma minus three. So gamma is five over three. Okay, so uh, let's call it uh, ideal gas. No, it's fine. So Let's look at a different case. So we're going to use the same relationship, but so brownie points. If anyone remembers, uh, what is the pressure due to? radiation so 
an electromagnetic wave in a box. So imagine these two walls uh, of the of the of the box. And it is filled uh, with radiation, and the radiation has um, well, this is the, the wavelength, so this will be you know, one half, and then you have, sorry, um, this is the second one, and then the third one, it lights, looks like that. Um, but you can only have specific values for the wavelength, the ones that fit inside the box. So the potential, I mean, the internal energy is the sum here, SJ is the number of particles that you have of that particular uh, wavelength. I shouldn't call them particles. Um, H bar and then the, the wavelength. Um, or the, the angular frequency. What's that? So the pressure is the change in energy with respect to the volume. So it's going to be this guy so essentially uh, when you compress or or expand this box, the wavelengths can change uh, continuously, uh, but the the wavelengths that are allowed uh, change, um, or are given by your normal modes here. So. This guy is minus one third of omega j divided by d. So essentially, um, you divide by the decrease of freedom, the volume, so you have three, and then the uh, angular frequency just depends on the change in the on the on the size of the box which are changing here so the pressure is u divided by 3v and u over v is the energy density so the pressure is energy density divided by 3 so I'm going to do the same thing. In this case, one over gamma minus one is three. So gamma is four thirds. This is for radiation. So what do you expect radiation to do? If 
you try to constrain it gravitationally. And you're not in a black hole. It's going to be tough. It's just going to be released. So an ideal gas. You can constrain it gravitationally. Radiation, uh, not so much. So, so we know that in general, the energy density has that relationship with the pressure. So the thermal energy, epsilon, mm, this is P. And that comes from um, the definition. Of uh, epsilon. We derived this one before as well. So the three the three P over here, I'm just moving it over here. This is omega. So then we can write um, epsilon in terms of omega. And gamma. We're going to do some algebra. We're going to solve for um, epsilon in terms of only uh, gamma. And the total energy. So the total energy is omega plus uh, epsilon. Epsilon is total energy, I mean omega equals total energy minus epsilon. Get that one.
So, epsilon is the total energy um, divided by four minus three gamma, which is minus total energy Uh, 3 gamma minus 4. Okay, so the uh, the next one is um, easier because we already have epsilon. So omega. I'm gonna just get to the final answer. I can check my notes. It's gonna be that. So what are these two equations? What are they telling us? It's a relationship between the total energy of the system, the thermal energy, and the gravitational potential energy uh, in terms of gamma, which is which parametrizes uh, the particular phenomenon that is producing the pressure. So for an ideal gas, gamma is five thirds. For pure radiation, gamma is four thirds. So let's look at what happens, you know, what are the values? For the ideal gas. Mm, yep. We can get rid of these trees over here. We just get the five minus four. So minus E. And let's check the other one. So five thirds minus one, I guess minus three thirds. Five thirds minus four thirds. Get rid of the thirds. This is two e. And it's kind of a cool result because it tells you that epsilon is minus one half of omega. So anybody recognizes that? What is it? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, this relationship between the kinetic energy of epsilon and the potential energy omega. Yeah. Um, it's kind of cool. So in the case of the ideal gas, um, we recover the Virial theorem because the particles in the ideal gas um, do not interact. Essentially, they just have uh, their kinetic energy. There's no interaction between um, the molecules or the particles. So for radiation, gamma is four thirds. So what is the thermal uh, radiation energy? This is the relationship, so in this case is minus total energy, three, four thirds minus four. What is that? Goes up. And the one for omega also blows up. So what it tells you is that if you have pure radiation, then the uh, you, you cannot reach hydrostatic equilibrium. So you need at least some matter to um, stabilize the system. So when will you get close to the radiation limit, the four term, uh, four thirds? How will you get close to that radiation limit? In which cases? So let's talk about, you know, just a uh, gas giant. You know, like Jupiter, or uh, even a relatively small star like the Sun. It's going to be well described by the ideal gas. Well, there are going to be interactions, so it's not going to be exactly that. But it's going to be close, and you can have definitely stable gas giants. Um, you can also have you know, rocky planets, so the relationship uh, for um, matter, I guess, for for solids, um, it's not exactly the same as the ideal gas, but it doesn't blow up. So you can have stable rocky planets, uh, stable gas giants. But as the uh, the body becomes bigger and bigger, then at the core, the particles are going to be very, very energetic. So they um, they become relativistic, so they get closer and closer to becoming radiation. And that's why things like Beetlejuice, right? They're on the cusp of uh, instability. They are so massive that uh, they are close to exploding. So mm, oh, that was just me, no? So let's look at uh, another implication of this.
Um, imagine that you have, um, this is not infinite, but it's, uh, can I draw this? You have um, a lot of matter in here, but they're only weakly interacting gravitationally. So it is like a lot of, uh, of dust. So this is um, a cloud of interstellar dust or gas. Um, it's, um, it's not infinite. So, but the particles are very small. So omega is close to zero. Uh, but epsilon is not going to be, it's going to be finite. Why is it finite? Because you cannot reach absolute zero. And if you have any finite temperature, this cloud uh, gas is going to be emitting some radiation, right? So we are emitting radiation right now in the infrared. Uh, this one is going to be emitting radiation too in the infrared. So this is time. And we have a relationship, yeah, even by the virial theorem. Um, if the total energy is E over here, then the thermal energy is going to be minus E, and you're going to have uh, potential energy to E. And of course, energy. Uh, it's just a, a number. What matters is the change in energy, which you can measure. So it is emitting radiation. So what's going to happen to the total energy? Yeah, it's going to decrease. So that tells you what happens to these energies too. This one is just like the mirror image. And this one is twice. So there is going to be a time in which the total energy becomes negative and you know that means that the potential energy uh, is going to become negative. So it is gravitationally bound. So this is kind of cool because it tells you that the collapse of matter into star or uh, or a planet is almost inevitable it's a it's a consequence of the virial theorem as long as the the gas cloud is finite So one of the, I guess, uh, problems um, understanding why galaxies were created at all uh, is that you know, we will imagine, we imagine that at the very beginning of the universe, 
um, the distribution of matter was homogeneous. So if that is the case, you cannot really have a finite cloud. It will be just an infinite cloud with decreasing density. Um, apparently, it was not completely homogeneous, and you can see the small ripples in the uh, in the microwave background. But those small ripples is what really created, you know, these separated regions of matter. Um, and then it's just consequences like you're falling into uh, into a well. So. This is uh, also, um, you know, from the virial theorem, it has negative uh, heat capacity, right? So you add energy or you remove energy from the system uh, because it is being emitted, you know, through the radiation. Uh, it becomes smaller, more compact due to gravitation, and that increases the temperature. So you remove energy and you increase the temperature. It's kind of the opposite of what we see with regular matter. Um, and let me see if there's something I want to check. So The first, I guess this theorem was discovered, you know, kind of late 1800s. But at the time, uh, radioactivity was still uh, unknown. So even though people knew that the sun had to exist, they didn't know what kept it in place. So if it's only, you know, if, if, if you um, think of the sun, as, a, as an ideal gas that is being compressed by gravity, then um, with the current luminosity, uh, it will have existed for um, 100 million years. And they knew, you know, from um, analyzing rocks and from evolution, that was not possible. So they knew that there was something something missing. So what is uh, kind of paradoxical is that the nuclear reaction that fuels uh, stars, actually what it does is that it stops the heating uh, of, of the matter. But, you know, it seems from these equations, these set of equations, uh, that gravity will always win. So the end of the universe is expected to be, or close to the end, a bunch of black holes and radiation in between. Um, and black dwarfs. But eventually, you know, everything uh, will evaporate, including the black holes. So it will be just radiation which cannot be gravitationally um, bound. So I thought it was kind of cool. All right. Um, that is what I have for you today. So questions, comments, ideas? Teams people? No? Were you always this quiet? I don't know. <laughs> hmm. I thought so. Um, all right, sounds good. So I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you. It's Thanks a lot.